Hello, welcome to our weekly dialogue with Helga Zeppler-Rusch, the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. It's May 31st, 2023. I'm Harley Schlanger and I'll be your host. As we've been doing recently with these live webcasts, you can send in your questions or comments to questions at schillerinstitute.org and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can today. Helga has just returned from a trip to the People's Republic of China. What an amazing time to do such a trip as, as we are now, in a sense, in a midst between two paradigms. One, a paradigm of war that's being directed by NATO, by the United Kingdom and the United States against Russia in Ukraine with a, an escalation virtually every day. And on the other side, a tremendous mobilization for a new paradigm of cooperation based on economic development. And for the new paradigm, the Chinese government is engaging in both economic and diplomatic policies toward that new paradigm. We have on the one side the post-G7 meeting with the promise of more weapons, more money, more war, and on the other side, we're just seeing a lot of diplomacy. The Eurasian Economic Union just met. Uh, the Argentine foreign minister was in China. There's more talk every day of a move toward use of national currencies and away from the dollar system controlled by Wall Street and the city of London. So Helga, I'm sure you, had, you have quite a bit to say about the trip to China. Why don't we begin with a, a report from you on, on what you found on your visit? Well, um, I'm very happy because, you know, it, it is really important to be able to uh, go places, you know, with the three years pandemic, one was practically, you know, stuck in, in, in one place. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it again, what I have experienced so many times, I have to reiterate again. Being in China, and I visited uh, many institutions, and we also were, you know, invited to visit um, all kinds of industrial, um, you know, places, exhibitions, um, firms, um, and I can only say that that nothing, nothing ever has happened to me in China which would fit the absolute negative picture which is being portrayed by the mainstream media in the West. And that is really very upsetting because, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that China is a perfect country, uh, but, you know, it is absolutely not what is being said uh, in the West. It's a country which is incredibly different than the West. You People are generally very optimistic, uh, extremely uh, determined to accomplish things, to get things done to continue on the road to improve the well-being of the people. Um, and, you know, obviously one of the major differences is that the role of the common good as compared to the extreme individualism which we find in the West historically and, and culturally is much more uh, in the genes of the Chinese in thousands of years. So people are you know, in a certain sense, much more determined for the good of the country. And, you know, since we have now the 10 years anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, you know, this has been the most remarkable infrastructure project in the history of mankind, bringing economic development to many countries, especially in the global south. And that reflects itself in the kind of diplomacy you just mentioned. Because, you know, the, the countries of the global south uh, in general are extremely thankful that China reached out and gave them for the first time the opportunity to overcome poverty and underdevelopment. And nobody talks about the so-called debt trap. Uh, people are talking about, you know, that they have now a perspective, that they have now railways, uh, ports, uh, industrial parks. So I can only say, you know, what I have, I've said this many times in the past, but, you know, it is, first of all, totally unjust what is being done, the way China is being portrayed. Because, you know, if you demonize a country which has not um, a history of military aggression, if you look at the, you know, several thousand years of Chinese history, 
it had maybe a couple of wars, but as compared to the hundreds and hundreds of wars of the West, you know, it, it is an absolutely non-aggressive country. It does not try to proselytize its own model. Uh, it does not demand that other countries buy into the political system of China. It has the highest respect for the different uh, social system, what, what countries choose and the right for them to their own path. And, you know, naturally, uh, right now, people are extremely concerned about, you know, the hardening of the relationship between uh, the U.S. and China. Uh, and, you know, however, they don't do it from a standpoint of defensiveness. They do it, um, you know, determined. And, you know, I watched uh, two movies, uh, Chinese movies with uh, English undertitles, which were extremely interesting. One was on the history of the emergence of the Communist Party at the beginning of the 20th century, and the other one was about the uh, developments uh, of uh, the People's Republic of China after 49. And when you watch these movies, you get a sense of the tremendous accomplishment, how China, uh, you know, got rid of what they experienced as a great, um, you know, shame, the century of humiliation, the difficulties in founding uh, the first uh, transitional republic and then more years of civil war and then finally the creation of the People's Republic. And they do not want to have that kind of uh, trouble anymore. So they, are, they will defend themselves, but they are not aggressive. However, you know, um, the fact that recently the Chinese... Uh, uh, defense minister refused to meet the American Secretary of Defense in Singapore in the context of the Shangri-La Security uh, Conference uh, reflects a hardened mood that they do not want to be uh, pushed around uh, any anymore. And naturally, there is a big concern about the extension of global NATO, the fact that Japan will open up a NATO office as of now in next year in Tokyo. Um, these are all questions of, of uh, extreme concern. But anyway, I can only say, you know, if people have the chance to travel to China, it's, you know, it's not inexpensive, but it is something somebody should do in their lifetime once and open your eyes and see with your own eyes what you see. And you will find that, you know, the, the reality of China is very, very different than what is being portrayed in the Western media. And given the fact that the two largest economies, the United States and China, you know, if they don't work together, the whole world suffers. And the present idea to decouple what is being pushed uh, in the United States, or the more sophist uh, way of saying the same thing coming from the Euro European Union, to de-risk, what a word, you know, this is a complete uh, stupid word creation, uh, would be really devastating. It would be devastating for the world economy and it would be uh, catastrophic for, for European countries and it would imply the danger of a military escalation as Dr. Mahathir from Malaysia, in my view, completely correctly analyzed. He said it would be a world catastrophe if the, if the world would fall into two different uh, blocks and it would lead to a world war. So what the Chinese say to all of this, they say, well, if the uh, countries want to de-risk, they should do more trade with China because China is very reliable. So if you want to de-risk, then come on and, and trade more. Anyway, so I, I would have a lot to say, but maybe some of the questions will cause me to, to say a couple of more things. I think that's a good start. And we do have more questions on China, but this idea of de-risk, it reminds me of pre-bunking. There's a whole new Orwellian vocabulary that's being produced to explain away the intent for war that's coming from NATO. Uh, so uh, we have a question from Maria, who's the CEO of a Music Box Incorporated. She asks, what was, of all that you saw, what was the greatest lesson you brought back from your trip? Well, I don't know um, this Music Box, but I actually, <laughs> I actually uh, met several people from the music field and... Uh, that was, in one sense, the most impressive because they were totally excited about European classical music, 
I don't know if that pleases now uh, the questioner because I don't know if this music box is, uh, you know, involved in classical music. But for example, you know, there is a whole renaissance of classical music in China. A lot of young people, uh, several people I, I talked with basically said that when you go to a concert in Europe, um, you see uh, Beethoven or, or, you know, other classical composers, you see a lot of gray heads or white heads because mostly old people go to these concerts. In China, uh, it's the young people who are completely enthusiastic about classical music uh, because they recognize, you know, the, the absolute important contribution to the development of creativity, what classical music uh, does. So I would say that this cultural optimism and the openness for a dialogue with other cultures definitely was one thing which impressed me the most. And, um, you know, otherwise I would say it's the, the, um, you know, the attitude, how Chinese are, they, they are so oriented to get things done. You know, in a certain sense, they have all the virtues the Germans used to have, but no longer have. They are industrious, they are punctual, uh, they are reliable, um, they get their work done in time. They have a tremendous work morale. I mean, as I said, these were all virtues which Germany once was famous for in the 50s and 60s, maybe a little bit into the 70s, but now naturally, now the Germans, uh, especially younger people, want to have more free time. They want to have more leisure. Work is less important. I mean, there's a benefit for that, but, you know, the, the country as a whole suffers. So I think that to sum up those two points, you know, I think what impresses me all the time the most and this time uh, also is a general positive world outlook and an optimism which comes from that. Now, here's a question that came in from someone in San Jose. Are the Chinese you met worried about the possibility that the Biden administration would provoke a war over Taiwan? I think yes. Um, I think, you know, the, um, the idea that there could be a war is definitely in the minds of the more, you know, the think tanks and the um, people who are in the political, you know, activities. And, you know, I mean, what should they say? They look at, uh, they look at what happened with the NATO expansions, uh, in Europe, uh, six NATO expansions, which, you know, they clearly, uh, share the view of Russia and many countries in the global south that it was these NATO expansions which, uh, you know, contributed essentially to, to this war in, in Ukraine. And then they look at global NATO, you know, NATO was originally supposed to be a North Atlantic defensive alliance against the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. And when the Soviet Union uh, disintegrated and the Warsaw Pact disappeared, NATO should have dissolved. And instead, you know, now they are talking about global NATO uh, into the Indo-Pacific. Um, as I said already, you know, they, they want to open up an office in Japan. And naturally, the various activities of NATO-related uh, ships and the forces in the South China Sea, and you know, naturally, the continuous provocations around Taiwan, delivering weapons to Taiwan, um, Pelosi being de facto an official member of the government, despite the fact that she is from the Congress, but in terms of line of uh, you know. Uh, hierarchy, she, she is in the line of uh, the government of the United States. And, you know, despite the fact that the Biden administration also gives, gives lip, lip service to the One China policy, which is international law, uh, nevertheless, they keep pushing um, the uh, independence of Taiwan, encouraging uh, forces there to, to go in this direction. And, you know, obviously the Chinese do regard Taiwan as being part of mainland China and they regard this as an extreme provocation and a red line which absolutely must not be crossed. So I think that there is clearly um, a determination. There were articles, not, not, not recently, but a little while ago, 
discussing, you know, if it would come to a military confrontation over Taiwan. Uh, the PLA is absolutely uh, convinced and, and, and certain that they naturally would win any such military confrontation. Uh, just look at the map, you know, Taiwan is uh, many thousand miles away from the United States and just a few miles away from the mainland. So who has the logistical advantage uh, is pretty clear. And, uh, you know, naturally, uh, as long as it remains conventional, <clears throat> nobody has a chance to uh, mess around with Taiwan. So I think they are worried. And um, I think that that is why the relationship between China and uh, Russia I think is uh, absolutely, uh, you know, that is really there to stay. And if you look at the economic power of China and the military power of Russia as a combination, uh, it's definitely something one should not mess with. Now, I'll take up one more question on China right now from Patricia, who asks something that I, I hear somewhat with some frequency. Is there a deep state in China? that Biden works with? And is there a front that you may have met that, that seems to be more friendly, that's a fake, uh, but it's really part of the deep state as a deception? Uh, I think that that is completely off the wall. I mean, the Communist Party is, you know, uh, in control of the country. Uh, they have something which is called whole process democracy. Uh, and it is actually quite impressive. I think if you are interested really to find out about China, you should look at that more closely because, you know, they have a system whereby uh, nobody makes a career who does not go through all the different steps of government, starting with a local level. Um, then, you know, if you are uh, doing well on the local level, you, you will go to a county level, then from the county level, to a municipal level, from there then to a provincial level. And you have to go through all of these different uh, steps of leadership to qualify for <clears throat> higher positions of government or even in the, in the party. Um, and the Chinese argue that that is a much better system than the so-called Western parliamentarian democracy or even the presidential system uh, in the United States. Uh, because, you know, in Germany, for example, we had a politician once whose name was Müntefering, and he became sort of famous uh, because at one point he said, oh, it's completely unfair to be reminded of promises uh, I gave during the election campaign. You know, meaning that, you know, a politician can say in the election campaign whatever he wants, and then it doesn't matter what he does afterwards. In China, they they are very proud to say that there is an accountability not only leading into this process of elections, but especially coming out of it and you know making sure that whatever was discussed at, at various levels of decision making is being carried uh, out and carried through, and that the accountability exists afterwards. So I think you know. Whoever is spreading this idea about the deep state in China, I, I really I think it, it is not existent. And President Xi Jinping in particular, I mean, he was extremely emphatic in the earlier years of his, uh, of his office to make a campaign against corruption. Uh, and right now you, you can see that this has really gotten through all pores of society. For example, when you're trying to give the waitress in a restaurant a tip, they don't take it. Uh, they, they, they are basically told that, you know, and this is part of a long campaign, not to be uh, susceptible to, to money, uh, bribes and so forth. And, you know, I, I have only experienced that that is indeed the case. So, you know, I, I think that there are definitely many problems which still have to be tackled. I think you know, maybe people are working really very hard and uh, maybe people would, you know, enjoy to go more to theaters. But the only real criticism I have met, and I always make it a point to talk to as many people as I can, was um, that the government is not doing enough, that all the laws are good, that the government is good, 
But if some problem occurs, it just means the government should be more forceful uh, to make things functioning. And that is a completely different attitude than, let's say, in Germany, where people say, oh, too much government and you can't trust the government. It's the opposite in China. So, you know, I think that that line, whoever has peddled that, uh, has no credibility whatsoever. Now, here's a question from someone who is organizing with the urgent appeal that the Schiller Institute uh, sent out. And, and by the way, let me remind people, we're taking your questions at questions at schillerinstitute.org. So you can still send in your questions now. But this is someone who's circulating the, the statement for signatures. Um, she asks, can you say what you hope to accomplish with the statement the Schiller Institute issued the urgent appeal by citizens and institutions from all over the world to the next president of the United States. What is the intent of, of circulating that? Well, you know, on the 10th of June um, is the 60th anniversary of the famous speech by John F. Kennedy in the American University, which is generally called the peace, uh, his peace speech. And if you haven't done that yet, you should read that speech or even listen to him on, on, on YouTube because it is a beautiful speech where Kennedy, uh, you know, says that the world needs peace, uh, coming from America, but not a Pax Americana where the United States would enforce with weapons, uh, you know, to submit all others and that way have a peace of the, of the graveyard, uh, but to have a peace, you know, basically where each country can flourish and, and work together. And it's a very beautiful poetical speech. And, you know, it is so important that people listen to that speech. There are also other incredible speeches by Kennedy, for example, one on uh, where he talks about the importance of art and culture. Uh, which I can only underwrite every word he is saying there, that it is the culture of a country which is what makes it human and what makes it beautiful. So, you know, first of all, many young people have no real idea who Kennedy was because they are born long, long after he has been assassinated and therefore they don't have a vivid idea anymore that he represented a completely different paradigm of American politics. And this is very important because, you know, what I want to accomplish with that is, as I mentioned before, we are in an unbelievable historic transformation right now, uh, of which people in the West are hardly aware. The global South is shifting. First of all, they have a completely new uh, self-assuredness. They have the economic ties especially with China, but also, you know, with, with, uh, among each other, Brazil, India, Indonesia, these are all major countries who are now rising. And, you know, the danger would be that the West remains arrogant and, you know, basically says, who are these people from the South? They should be submitting to the unipolar world because they will not. And it would be very dangerous if you would have a complete separation into two blocks, uh, a Western block uh, and a block, you know, Russia, China, the global South, because, you know, if you, you can't solve the problems of the world by, by this separation. And if, you know, uh, the dynamic would continue that it would all turn anti-American, which is clearly a tendency because you know, the United States, there was just a report by one of the American universities. I forgot which one, Harley, if you know it, you can fill it in later. Uh, and they came, they made a study and they said that uh, the interventionist wars in which the United States was involved after 9-11 resulted in 4.5 million deaths. <laughs> now that is an unbelievable figure. And naturally, there are many people in, in the global south also who uh, are not exactly friendly to the United States, and that's probably an understatement of the year. And it would be very devastating if, if that 
would remain like that because I think that if that is the tendency, World War Three is unfortunately uh, very likely to down the road or sooner or later. So, you know, since Kennedy represents a completely different paradigm of American politics, more like it was meant to be with the founding fathers, the American Revolution, uh, the War of Independence against the British Empire, um, John Quincy Adams' conception of foreign policy, Lincoln, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and then Kennedy, who after all diffused the Cuban Missile Crisis together with Khrushchev, uh, and who had a very optimistic idea about the ability of man to solve any problems through science and technology. So it's a different paradigm, and you know, by um, you know making this appeal by basically saying you know that what the whole world wishes um, is that the United States would go back to that kind of a paradigm which Kennedy represented. You know, I think that first of all, it will help to educate people around the world to look at the United States in a more differentiated way. And hopefully inside the United States uh, also causes Americans to review their own history. Because as my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, emphatically always said, that things went wrong with America after the assassination of Kennedy and especially the cover-up through the Warren Commission. Because if you assassinate the president of a country, you know, which obviously, you know, the lone assassin theory does not hold for one minute, uh, and then you have a cover-up and the institutions of that country are not able to, you know, to remedy that or to, to find out the truth, uh, and, and find justice. This is a extremely, you know, this was a, a break in the history of of the United States. And you know, the last fifty, you know, now sixty years, um, almost sixty years. Uh, you know, that that is something one has to work through and find back to the kind of values which which existed with Roosevelt, with Kennedy. And uh, I think that that's the purpose. And to 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 you know to I always you know think one should relate to the best tradition of the other and not the worst. When I founded the Schiller Institute in 1984, um, the main purpose was to contribute to a just new world economic order, and the idea that this is only possible if one has a renaissance of classical culture and a dialogue of uh, the best traditions of all cultures with the idea that peace is really possible when you relate to the best of the other person or the other country or the other tradition and vice versa because then you 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 bring forward what is good in the other and you know that is the basis for peace so i hope that with that and you know the memory comes back uh, you know that america should become again a force of good in the world and then the whole world would would be peaceful and happy okay happiness is important as, as your husband always said you have to have fun i have two more questions for you helga one goes back to the war danger and it's from uh, leo who said uh, thank you for your good work uh, he asks about NATO's Air Defender 23 exercises coming up in, in about 10 days. And will these be used as a cover, similar to what Seymour Hirsch accused the NATO naval exercises in, the, in June 22 to plant the explosives that blew up the Nord Stream pipeline? He said, could these exercises be used for a provocation? Well, I think the reference to the Nord Stream 2 and how this maneuver was, was used actually gives reason for worry that something like that is possible. But even without that, uh, you know, these uh, Defender 23 maneuvers for sure will take place in a period of utmost tensions already, uh, escalated warfare, uh, the recent new drone attacks into Moscow, 
um, you know, show this is called the terrorist act by by the Russians, and naturally, you know, it's uh, it, it's a, it's an it's an atmosphere of of extreme tension, and even before and even without maneuvers, we had, you know, in the last several years, so many incidents where, you know, fighter jets almost had collisions or you had almost uh, accidents with ships and, and, and jets. And I said, you know, if world peace depends on the ability of a pilot to avoid an accident, <laughs> you know, then we are really in bad shape. So I think that, you know, unfortunately, I have to, I have to say that, that there is worry uh, for this period. And, you know, we should, you know, we should really escalate our campaign uh, even if it does not look likely right now, um, that there must be negotiations. And, you know, you have many, many forces. Lula is, uh, President Lula of Brazil, uh, he's uh, all the time trying to get this peace club of the developing countries together. You have the Chinese, uh, you know, trying to get support for their 20, or their 12th principle uh, plan, which, you know, high-ranking Chinese official just traveled in Europe, but he found very little response. Uh, Pope Francis is still uh, very active trying to promote the role of the Vatican as a negotiation. So I think that that, you know, needs to be strengthened. And no matter what the refusal is, uh, that is the way to go. So I can only say we should all be mobilized and uh, we need a strong peace movement a much stronger peace movement than we have it right now. And, um, you know, the mobilization around the tents where we have in many cities around the world rallies in the morning and then U.S. time in the afternoon, we have a conference uh, which I think takes place in either Washington or New York. I'm not sure right now. But we have rallies around the world, so you should join them and express your your absolute determination to... Uh, make the peace movement strong enough to, to be heard and not to be overheard. And one of the ways you can do that is to make a copy of the urgent appeal by citizens and institutions from all over the world to the next president of the United States. Print it, copy it, distribute it, uh, send it out via social media. Let's get people talking about these ideas that Helga has been uh, presenting in terms of what actually is the better tradition of the United States. And Helga, that brings me to the final question uh, from Lori, who asks, will we ever get our inalienable rights and our constitutional freedoms back in America? Well, I think it requires a new American revolution, you know. I mean, I can only say, you know, if America does not get these inalienable rights back, the whole world will suffer. Because, you know, you have right now a situation where the United States is the strongest military power. Um, maybe Russia has certain technological advantages here and there, but, you know, the U.S. does have a mighty military uh, complex and, you know, not only that. So I think, you know, I think the whole fate of humanity depends on the answer to, uh, to that question to be positive. Because if, you know, we have a financial crisis, um, you know, the skilla and charybdis between hyperinflation and the chain reaction collapse is clearly presently there and it's reflected in the fact that the central banks, uh, you know, are really hovering between interest rate rising and, and lowering and rising again. But if you had a collapse of the system, you know, I think that that would be the heightened danger of war because I don't think that the West would disintegrate as peacefully as the Warsaw Pact did in 91. So I think, you know, the kind of reform and the kind of reorganization of the financial system as part of the new global security and development architecture, which the Schiller Institute has been mobilizing for, is really extremely urgent, you know. And uh, right now, I think 
a similar approach, and I can assure you quite independently of of each other because I did not coincide with uh, Chinese before I made this proposal, and I can prove that anyway, that's a different matter. Um, you know, the Chinese government, otherwise Xi Jinping has this uh, triple approach of the global uh, security initiative, the global development initiative, and the global civilization initiative, which is all part of a package. And that is a framework for such discussions. And I can only say we have to convince our European, you know, countries, because I don't think you can, I, I've almost given up the hope that you can, can convince the Western establishments because they're like the three monkeys, you know, blind, uh, deaf, and um, I know also don't think, um, they, they, they don't speak, yeah, so they are, you know, they, they, I think they are so arrogant and, and convinced that they are the superior, like Joseph Borrell, that they are sitting in this beautiful garden and the rest of the world is a jungle. I mean, the whole world laughs about that, but they don't get it. They don't get it. They just, just are completely unwilling and unable to review their own behavior and correct it if they would find it full of flaws but that does not occur to them. So I think we have to mobilize the citizens. Um, and, you know, I think that that is really a question of, um, you know, not only the United States needs to go back to its inalienable rights, but all of Europe, because Europe right now is not uh, following its own interest. Um, I think we are being forced in a in an unipolar world, which is uh, very detrimental to the interest of the European nations. So I think we need a mobilization of the state citizens, or citizens have to become state citizens, meaning they have to qualify to know what's going on and not just rely on the very, uh, you know, very evil mass media at this point, because they are streamlined in ways which is, um, you know, has not happened since 80 years in Germany, for sure. So I think we need citizens to be awake, to study, to, you know, learn about foreign policy, learn about economics, and take responsibility for your own country, and then we have a chance. It means you should work with us. Well, let me thank all of you for your questions. We obviously have run out of time and couldn't take them all. Uh, but Helga, let me thank you. I know you're somewhat jet lagged just coming back, but uh, uh, I'm sure everyone appreciates what, what you've been contributing to the discussion and will take seriously your appeal to join this mobilization to bring back the best tradition of America and not just for America, but for everyone. So Helga, thanks again, and I'll see you next week. Yes, till next week.